Good, thank you. Okay, everybody, thanks so much for being with us today for the Caring Conference. Carolyn is our next presenter, and she's going to tell us how she went from no to no, making the impossible possible. Carolyn, go ahead and take it away. Yes, thank you. I'm Carolyn McGinn, co-founder of Mindful Care at Home, based on my family's treasured transformation. And I, as we get started, I'd just like to ask you, what's one thing that you desire for yourself that you believe is not possible? feel free to type it in the chat box, write it down. We're gonna come back to it later. So just, you can keep thinking as you're going. And some things that I hear often, some common beliefs that keep us in the world of it's impossible is it's impossible to lose weight after 40. We all know that, except for the women who are in great shape in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and beyond. I can't open a business because I don't have what it takes to be an entrepreneur. That's one I hear a lot in my women business world. I can't buy a house in this market. That's another one they hear, especially hear it in this market. I was talking with a woman just yesterday and she said she's 54 years old. She really wants to go back and get her degree, but she's too old. So I'm too old to get my degree. I'm too old to lose weight. I don't have what it takes to open a business. And this last one is really a tough one to hear. I can't be a caregiver and have my own life my health, my sanity, because caregiving takes those away. So what's yours? What's your impossible desire? And once you have it, what's the reason that you believe it's not possible? Because society says it's not possible, because the experts say it's not possible, and that's, that was huge in what you're gonna hear about my family, that the experts told us it was impossible. Maybe it's your family that says it's not possible or your own internal critic, your own internal voices, your own thoughts. So what is yours? What are, what are the things that you want for yourself? And that leads me to, the most important thing that I have to say in this presentation. In fact, it's so important that you don't even need the rest of the presentation. <laughs> Without intention, you fall into the statistics. If I had known how important those words were, <laughs> I would have written down who said it. But one of my mentors went to a conference and heard a speaker who said these words, and she came back and did a whole talk on it. And I believe it was, I love giving credit where credit is due. I believe it was Joseph Chilton Pierce. If it wasn't, then I apologize to whoever it was. But I want you to just take a moment and really let these words sink in. Without intention, you fall into the statistics. And if we take a look at some statistics, 80% of people who lose weight gain it back. Fewer than 50% of businesses succeed past year five. 40%, 40% of caregivers will be unable to care for their caree until the end. We are losing our caregivers to burnout, to their own health issues. Sometimes they're even passing away before the person they're taking care of. I just want to add a, a word of caution about that last statistic. I just want to caution everybody to, to take that as just as a possibility, but I, I struggle with that statistic, I just want to say, and the research around okay. it. So I okay. just want to get, I just want to put a word of caution out there for everybody. So that brings us back to without intention. 
Oh, and, and I will say, Denise, that I got that uh, statistic from Tipa Snow, and she did say that it is from burnout, from health issues. And okay. And I, it's, so if it's Tipa Snow, it might be specific to dementia caregivers, and it's okay. just really important to make sure that that statistic is put in the right context. Thank you. So worth repeating, without intention, you fall into the statistics. And I want to share two examples of not falling into the statistics and how very powerful intention can be. The first story is Stacy's story. Stacy is my sister and she lives in Maryland. Rewind to 2010 and we were in a housing crisis. Houses were not selling. The federal government even had a, a tax credit program for people who were selling a home and buying a new house. So she called me one day and said, this was probably end of February, 1st of March, 2010. And she said, I'm going to sell my townhouse and buy my dream home. And being the loving, caring, encouraging sister that I was at the time, I said, are you kidding me? How are the houses selling in your neighborhood? And she said, oh, well, they're not. Um, there's probably 18 for sale in my neighborhood and one sold for like 20,000 under asking, but I can't do that because I have calculated exactly how much I need to get from my townhouse in order to buy my dream home. She goes, and I've got to do it because my family needs more room. My daughter's about to turn one. She can't learn to walk in this townhouse. It's too narrow. There's too much furniture. She doesn't have enough room. So then she said, the reason I'm calling is I want you to come up and help me declutter so my realtor can stage the house. And I said, sure. Still skeptical, but I came up. And I drove into her driveway and the house that was attached to her, the townhome attached to her, had a single car driveway with a car in it and another car beside of that car and then another car literally on center blocks with grass at least knee deep and I just walked through the front door and said nobody is going to come into your home with the Beverly Hillbillies living next door it's not going to happen she said yep that's what everybody keeps saying, but it's a rental and I called the realtor. They're moving out April 30th, but that won't help me because I have to be out of this house and in my dream home before April 30th to get my tax credit and I'm doing it. She is so set in her intention. So we decluttered our house and the college hunks Paul and John came and picked up the clutter, took it away, and she packed up her family and came to North Carolina, where our family's from, for the weekend, while the realtor staged her house. And Sunday afternoon rolls around. We all gather around the computer to see her home, and it looks fabulous. I would want to live there. Of course, I was still, you know, being my supportive self. I said, Stacy, you have a one-year-old. You can never keep your house looking like that. And she said, you are right. I'm going to have to sell this really fast. So, excuse me. That was Sunday afternoon. They drove back to Maryland. On Tuesday, I get a phone call and she said, I sold the townhouse. I said, you're kidding. She said, it's such a great story. The people that we bought it from are in the military and they were transferred to Montana. They are being transferred back here, got on the computer yesterday, saw their house was for sale and instantly made an offer. They know the house, they know the neighborhood, they know the neighbors, they want to live here. So she sold her townhouse, bought her dream home, and the day she moved in, her daughter Madison 
learned to walk. She took her first steps. And for those of you who are Gabby Bernstein fans, she wrote, the universe has your back. To me, that was the universe's way of saying, I had your back. I had it, your back every step of the way. And Stacy never wavered in her intention of what she wanted for her family. So with intention, the universe has your back. And that, that's for me and Gabby Bernstein. Which leads to our story, my family story, my mother's story. My mother has stage six Alzheimer's disease. She was living with my brother and my sister-in-law for three years. It was just becoming too much, especially for my brother, the 24 seven care, it was just too much. When the pandemic hit, I closed my massage therapy practice and started helping full time, but it was still just too much on them. And I had this idea, I'm gonna get my mom her own apartment and it'll be designed for her and we will bring in paid caregivers to help us take care of her. I found an apartment and I was on my way to look at it when I thought, who am I to do this? I don't know what I'm doing. I need to talk to some experts. I need to talk to people who know what I'm trying to do. So I called the nurse practitioner who worked in my mother's neurologist's office whose mother had Alzheimer's. I talked with social workers, I talked with CNAs, I talked with family people, and every person I talked to, with the exception of my niece Raven that you'll learn about in a minute, every person we talked to said, don't do it. It's impossible. Caregivers won't show up. Your mother's gonna be left alone. It will be a nightmare and you're going to reach a point where you cannot care for her at home. So I made the decision knowing in my heart, it was not the right decision for my mom. I know a lot of people thrive in memory care units, but I knew that my mother would not be one of them. I knew that, that in my heart, but I felt like it was the only choice we had. I put her in a memory care facility the first night there trying to find the bathroom, she fell, fractured her hip, and spent 10 days in the hospital. Being in the hospital during a pandemic with someone with dementia is a nightmare. It was so stressful. Only two people could be with her in a 24-hour period. So we were taking 12-hour shifts with a woman who couldn't remember that her hip was broken while trying to figure out our next steps. And what we were told is that she would go to rehab where we could see her one or two days a week. I mean, I'm sorry, one or two hours a day. And then, then she would go back to the memory care unit. And I was talking with my niece, Raven, the co-founder with me of Mindful Care at Home. And Raven said, I wish grandma just had her own place, a place where we could design it for her and she would get the care she needed. And I realized then that Raven and I had the same vision and we set such a strong intention in that moment to make that happen. My mother was in the hospital for 10 days in 10 days, we bought a townhouse, one story, five minutes from my house. Uh, I had told my realtor, we were looking for a place to buy or rent, please keep me in the loop. He called while I was at the hospital with my mom and said, there's a one story townhouse in this neighborhood. They're taking offers till tomorrow at two. And I called my niece who was at my house and said, call this realtor go look at it. If it's as perfect as I think it is, just make an offer. So she grabbed her purse, looked at my husband and said, I'm going to buy a house. 
to which he said, well, hold on, you're not running out for groceries here. Let's slow down. But she didn't. She went, looked at the house. It was perfect. We bought it. Uh, we found out later that when we made an offer with our story that it was being sold by three siblings whose mother had passed away and she had dementia as well and passed away in that townhouse. She stayed there uh, her whole life. They wanted, the neighbors told, her, told us that they had stopped taking offers because they wanted my family to have this house. We bought her a home, we designed it for her and we were able to hire the most wonderful caregivers imaginable. They love her the way we love her. So now my mom lives in her own home. She has her mailbox that she walks to to pick up the cards people have sent to her. She has quotations all over the walls that she can read over and over. They keep her entertained and she uses these as conversation pieces we figured out. She'll look at us and say, stay humble, work hard, be kind. And it's a way for her to start a conversation when she otherwise doesn't know how. She has a folding station to keep her hands busy when she's sundowning. She has cash available to go shopping in her closet at 2 a.m. if she wants to, because it's her house and she has caregivers there. It's all designed around her. It just worked out so beautifully when we had the strong intention to make it happen. So I'd like to do an activity. I want you to write down one belief that you have that's making something impossible for you. And I'm gonna do this with you. And I'm writing down, and I know I have this one because I hear myself say it. It's not something that I think consciously, that I have it, but I hear it in my language. And I wrote down, I don't know if you can see it, aging sucks. Another one is, I know I have it because I say things like, yeah, growing old isn't for sissies, but yes, it is. Aging is for dental, kind, loving people who want to share their experiences with the world. So I'm gonna take this aging sucks, and I'm gonna make, and do this with your belief, I'm gonna make a big X through it. Say no to your no, because it's not true. Once you've made your big X, take a deep breath. And how does it feel to know that it's possible? Your next steps, each night, hold a picture of what you want in your head. And this is important, feel how it feels to have it. Let your negative thoughts just float away. And then in the morning, hold that picture again of what it is you want. And again, feel how it feels to have it. Let all the negative thoughts float away. Then let it go because the universe has your back. And take action as you see the opportunities just the doors will open up for you with intention. The universe has your back. Opportunities will open. And lastly, the moment one def definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. 
I like giving credit. So I looked that one up and a lot of people take credit for it. But I believe it was John Astor who said it first, the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. And I'm wondering what questions or comments you have. Um, one comment that I get sometimes is, Carolyn, I am too busy to make an intention. I'm too busy. I don't have time to go to the bathroom. I'm too busy. Allow yourself to daydream in whatever moment you can get for yourself. We all stand in line at the grocery store. Take a moment while you're standing there. Look at magazines. What images or words grab your attention? What types of magazines grab your attention? Also, while you're brushing your teeth, allow yourself to daydream. Think of something that you really desire for yourself that maybe you didn't know was possible. Another question I get is how do I know what's stopping me? How do I know where my blind spots are? And I would say to that, listen to your language. What are the things that you say, even jokingly? Uh, like for me, I make joking comments about my age all the time. Uh, I don't mean it. And I know my body's listening to me. Aging is beautiful and I'm gonna do it in a healthy way. One activity or one thing you can do to really hear what's coming out of your mouth is record your side of phone conversations. This is a great way uh, to, to play back your own voice and to hear the tone that you use, the humor that you use, the language that you use. Carolyn, I just wanna let you know that you are at time. I'm at time, oh great, okay. <laughs> well, I happen to be, Finished. Okay. Yeah. So if <laughs> you want to wrap it, yeah, if you want to wrap Reach it up, me at <laughs> mindfulcareathome.com or mindfulcareathome at gmail.com. And do you have a photo of you and Raven? I think you quickly went through. There was a photo that you just quickly, oh, it was just you. Okay. Yes. I thought it was um, just, yeah, the, right. I thought, Raven's oh, there. Raven's yeah. No. Background. Yes, yes. That's her beautiful face over to yes. the side. So yes. Raven and I are the founders of Mindful Care at Home, helping family caregivers specifically dealing with dementia uh, take care of their loved ones in a home environment. Okay, thank you so much, Carolyn. Thank, thank you. you so much.